Hi, how's it going? Hello everyone. I've heard it said that the Acaso Brave 8 camera is a good budget option with most of the performance of today's top action cameras at a far lower price. But instead of comparing it to those four to $500 action cams, I decided to compare it to an older camera that is roughly the same price. In this case, my first gen DJI Osmo Action that I actually got years ago for $189 new. Unfortunately, with everything going on the last few years, the price has gone back up to $300, though I have seen it with several extra batteries and other accessories included for that price. The Brave 8 is only $20 to $40 less than the Osmo Action New, and the DJI is nearly four years old at this point, so it should be an interesting comparison. Physically, the two are extremely similar. The Brave 8 seems to have been, let's just say, inspired by the design of the DJI. The DJI is a bit smaller, but from almost every angle there are obvious similarities. Even the included open frame housings are remarkably similar. The similarities continue right into the buttons, their functionality, and even the swiping from different sides on the display to bring up various menus. The DJI has a slightly better feel and perceived build quality, but they're actually quite similar in this regard as well. Both have USB-C ports for charging and data transfer, though on the Acaso, the opening in the housing isn't quite big enough to get the door open with the housing on. You can remove the door and put the housing back on, but then you lose the weather sealing when it's open. Also, because of the orientation of the card and the size of the opening, it's a bit difficult to get the card out with the case on, even with the door removed. It's much easier on the DJI. No big deal. Both have touchscreens on the back and a front-facing screen as well. The DJI shows its first real advantage with the screens. Despite its smaller overall size, the front and rear screens on the DJI are larger than the ones on the Acaso, and more importantly, the rear screen on the DJI is far higher resolution. Since you don't have to judge focus or anything on them, it's probably not a huge deal, but the screen on the DJI is much nicer. When powering them up, you find the next advantage the DJI has. It seems like a small thing, but when out and about and using the cameras a lot side by side, the short press of the power button and subsequent quick power up of the DJI was convenient and consistent, while the Acaso requires a long press of the power button, uh, several seconds before it will turn on, and then it still takes notably longer to boot up and be ready to go. With gloves on or with the camera mounted in an awkward position, it often took multiple tries to get the camera to power on because, you know, I didn't hold it long enough or I wasn't pushing the button hard enough, something like that. Not a big deal, but it just, you know, it was a little bit nicer to use the DJI for that reason. Interestingly, it doesn't require nearly as long of a press to power the camera off as it does to turn it on. In use, the DJI's overall response is faster and more polished when scrolling through menus, choosing options, playing back videos, etc. The Acaso isn't terrible, but it's a bit laggy in comparison and sometimes it takes multiple attempts to get a setting to actually change. There are also some settings which change without warning and do not turn back on on their own. The main one is image stabilization. There are three image stabilization modes on the Acaso, off, normal, and super. Normal is in-camera stabilization, and the super mode uses gyro data and must be exported to and stabilized within the Acaso app on a mobile device. So if you select the super mode stabilization and don't stabilize it within the app afterward, that video will have zero stabilization on it. And every resolution this camera offers has frame rates which do not support in-camera stabilization. But if you have normal stabilization on and switch to any mode which does not support it, stabilization switches to off, not to super mode, even if that resolution and frame rate supports the super mode stabilization. The camera does not give any indication that this has happened, and if you switch back, stabilization does not turn back on. Making matters worse, anytime you change resolution, it defaults to the highest frame rate available for that resolution, none of which support the in-camera stabilization. So that means that every time you switch from any resolution to any other resolution, the in-camera stabilization automatically turns off, even if you switch down to a frame rate that supports in-camera stabilization before you close the menu. So you have to remember to turn it back on or you will have nothing you wouldn't even be able to stabilize it in the app at that point because it doesn't default to super mode, it defaults to off. 
Another small issue is that one-touch recording does not work properly on the Akaso. There's an option where, instead of long pressing the power button to turn the camera on, you can long press the record button to turn the camera on and begin recording immediately. This feature doesn't work. With this feature turned on in the menu, a long press of the record button does turn the camera on, but it does not start recording. At that point, you can start recording yourself by pressing the record button, and you can stop it again by pressing the record button like normal. However, once the camera has been turned on this way, if you attempt to change any menu settings, it will suddenly kick you out of the menu and start recording. Then, when you click the record button to stop this sudden unrequested recording, the camera shuts off. And for anyone curious, I did connect the camera to the app and update it to the latest firmware. By contrast, when this feature is turned on on the DJI, a single, short press of the record button turns the camera on and it starts recording within a second or two. Another thing that I think is just poor behavior on the Akaso is that if you have any menus or settings pop-ups open, you cannot start recording. So pressing recording makes the beep like it started recording, but it doesn't. So when the camera is anywhere even slightly awkward, or when the sun is making it tough to see the little green record light or the screen, it's easy to have accidentally touched the screen on the back and inadvertently opened one of the options, and some of which only require a tap, not a swipe, and once that happens, you cannot start recording until you close that menu. This did lead to times where I pushed record, it beeped, and I assumed it was recording, but when I went to stop recording, I found that it actually wasn't recording and some menu was open. On the DJI, even if you're in a menu, pressing record will close whatever menu is open and it will begin recording immediately. I greatly prefer this behavior. The Akaso does include a wireless remote, which could come in handy, and it has a little display on it that tells you when the camera's recording, so it could at least partially make up for that failing to record issue because the remote tells you if it's recording or not. So it's not a perfect solution or anything, but it does come with a remote, which could be handy for other situations too. For anyone curious, the Akaso breaks up clips longer than a few minutes into multiple files. I think the cutoff point is around 3.2 gigabytes, at which point it starts a new clip. Battery life is similar between the two. I didn't do a controlled test on them to compare, but when just out and about and doing the exact same things with both, the battery life seemed similar. The battery life seemed a bit more consistent on the DJI, which may just be due to a slightly more reliable and consistent battery gauge. The battery gauge on the Akaso seemed a bit questionable at times. Overall, despite the included remote for the Akaso, the DJI is just nicer to use. It's a better, more polished experience. So let's talk about performance and recording modes. Future editing me cutting in here. When I got to the stage of editing where I began adding clips from the Akaso to the timeline, I had a problem. All the clips came in as 15 frames per second. I couldn't retime them or manually adjust the frame rate. The rest of the frames were simply not there. Playing them back at 29.97 frames per second, which is what they recorded at, resulted in st basically a stop motion look. Manually changing the clip's frame rate simply made them run at 2x speed. I tried quite a bit, including putting clips into their own project and timeline, changing the interpretation of each clip's uh, frame rate manually, rendering them different ways, re-importing them, and um, I even updated from DaVinci Resolve 17 to 18. The files are encoded as a variable frame rate, and it just seems that there's some issue with the way the file reports the number of frames to DaVinci. The files play fine in QuickTime, so Maybe other editors won't have this problem, but I didn't want to start all over with a different editing program that I'm not as familiar with, and then possibly still end up with issues. I ended up using Handbrake to transcode every file to a constant frame rate, and then I could import them into DaVinci without issue. I experimented to be sure I kept the image quality completely intact, and I compared every video before and after very carefully to ensure I didn't detect any issues or quality loss. So in the end, I had a folder of files that looked exactly like the originals and worked in DaVinci. But it was a frustrating issue that cost me nearly an entire day, including hours of transcoding. I don't know if you'll run into this issue, but I think it's worth knowing it's a possibility. Anyway, back to the video. The Akaso doesn't have a 24 frame per second frame rate in any of the recording resolutions for anyone curious. 
The DJI does. Not a big deal, but I appreciate a 24 FPS mode. As mentioned before, the Akaso doesn't support in-camera stabilization in all modes. What Akaso calls normal stabilization is available in 4K, 16x9, 30 frames per second, and 2.7K and 1080p up to 60 frames per second. All 4x3 modes and all 4K60 modes do not support in-camera stabilization. On the DJI, stabilization is supported up to 4K60, so the DJI has a slight advantage there, but the Akaso has the app stabilization option, including 4K60. Unfortunately, there are a couple problems with stabilization using the app. First, it took nearly 10 minutes to export and process a 2 minute and 50 second clip, and that doesn't include any of the time it took getting the camera connected to the app, finding the right video with the slowly loading thumbnails that pop in, and then waiting for it to recognize which ones had the gyro stabilization active, then selecting it, choosing all the export options, and starting the export. Nor did it include the time that it took to transfer the file off of my phone onto my computer once it was done. So it's a time-consuming process even for a single short clip, and unfortunately the end result isn't as stable as DJI's in-camera stabilization at 4K60, and it's not even quite as stable as Akaso's own in-camera stabilization, or at least it wasn't in my testing. Here are two clips, one recorded with the DJI at 4K60, the other on the Akaso at 4K60 with the super stabilization processed in the app. The Akaso isn't too bad, but the DJI is smoother. In terms of in-camera stabilization, the Akaso does a pretty good job in most situations. When walking with the camera handheld, or when on the shaky windshield of my scooter, it does a good job on normal roads even at night. Other than a slight jitter once in a while after a large bump, it does a pretty good job and it seems close to the DJI in stabilization. However, if you move to a gravel road, suddenly there's a big difference. The Akaso is almost keeping up, and it's certainly better than nothing, but in a rough situation like this, it gets a bit jittery, and the DJI definitely does a better job. The Akaso does have more slow motion modes. It can actually go twice as slow as the DJI at a what they call a 16x slowdown versus 8x on the DJI, which works out to 240 frames per second on the DJI or 480 frames per second on the Akaso. But the Akaso can only do the 480 frames per second in 720p. There is definitely a quality loss, but there's also a crop which I didn't expect, so I apologize for the poor framing. Obviously, the quality is a big step down from the DJI, but the DJI was only at 240 frames per second versus 480. When both are at 1080p, 240 frames per second, the image quality is much closer, though I might still give the DJI a slight edge, and also the DJI records audio in slow motion, while the Akaso does not. Speaking of audio, let's take a listen to that. All right, now I'm recording with both cameras, 
and I'm just using the internal microphones. I don't have wind protection or you know voice accentuation or whatever they call it enabled on either one of them. I just just a regular audio internal microphones on both cameras. And this is how each of them sound. I'm holding them both just with little handles and they're probably maybe 12 to 18 inches at most away from my mouth. So pretty close. Uh, they're not facing me, but otherwise it's darn near an ideal scenario for uh, the internal mics. So this is how they sound. And here's a bit of a lower light test, uh, just in the form of a <laughs> shady forest. And uh, now also an external audio test. The Acaso, I'm using the available Acaso Lavalier USB-C microphone, which from what I've read is actually the only microphone that does work with this camera. Uh, other people have tried other brands of USB-C lavaliers and they have not worked. For the DJI Osmo Action, I'm using the available three and a half millimeter microphone input jack accessory. And I just have a lavalier microphone plugged into that. So here is how the audio compares between the two. In the case of the Acaso, it is the Acaso brand uh, USB-C lavalier microphone. I've seen reports that people have tried all kinds of different USB-C microphones of other brands, and they have not worked. So apparently only the Acaso brand works. While getting the external 35 millimeter jack accessory and a lav mic is almost certainly going to be more expensive than just getting the Acaso USB-C mic, that Acaso mic is the only option for the Brave 8, and it's pretty terrible. It's very possible that either my mic or the camera is defective, especially considering the loud noise that starts after a minute or so. But either way, the mic is very cheaply made. It does have a braided cable, but it goes right into a large, flimsy mic body, and there's no strain relief. The, cam the cable can just slip around inside the, the mic housing. So I can't imagine it would be very durable regardless. For me, the DJI is the clear audio winner. The DJI is also the winner in terms of image quality. The Acaso isn't too bad, but even in H.265 high bitrate mode, it falls behind the DJI in a lot of situations. At night on my scooter, there isn't much difference between the two. But the DJI has a higher ISO range, so if you are filming in low light, you can make the image a little bit brighter if you want. The DJI also has slightly more accurate color, better sharpness and contrast in most situations, and a bit better dynamic range, though neither one is fantastic in normal mode. However, the DJI has an HDR mode. There's no stabilization in HDR, but a tripod situation can produce a shot with far more dynamic range than the Acaso. The HDR mode has limitations, and it certainly isn't something you'd use all the time, but it can make a big difference in some situations, and I think it makes the DJI a bit more versatile camera. Speaking of versatility, when not in HDR mode, the DJI has a fully manual exposure option and a flatter color profile option in case you want to tweak the color yourself. The Acaso has a wider range of speeds for the hyperlapse or motion time lapse than the DJI does. It can actually go all the way down to 5 or maybe even 2x speed, whereas the DJI, the lowest is 10x. However, the Acaso seems to have little to no stabilization. Even when I'm walking very carefully and trying to keep the cameras level and steady, it results in a jittery clip from the Acaso. The DJI does a much better job. The Acaso also has a 48 megapixel photo mode. Maybe it needs to be on a tripod or something, but in my testing, it produced worse pictures than the 12 megapixel mode. Both options are a four by three ratio. The DJI has no different resolution options, but it does have a 4x3 and a 16x9 photo mode, and both look far better than the pictures that come out of the Acaso. The difference in clarity and detail is pronounced. The DJI also takes pictures almost instantly, while the Acaso takes a second or two in 12 megapixel mode, and even longer than that in 48 megapixel mode. So as an impromptu option for snapping a couple pics, the DJI is far better. Overall, the Acaso is an okay camera. It has okay image quality, decent image stabilization up to 4K30, an inconvenient and slightly worse stabilization at 4K60, a motion time-lapse mode with no stabilization, photo mode with relatively poor photos, a handy wireless remote included, a lot of slow motion modes, and an available external mic that's not very good. 
The Osmo Action is $20 to $40 more right now. It has better image quality, more reliable operation, more responsive controls, better image stabilization up to 4K60, better motion time lapse with stabilization, an HDR mode, high quality external audio options, more manual controls, 24 frames per second, better display, and more. It doesn't come with a wireless remote, and it doesn't have as slow of slow motion. Ultimately, the Acaso might seem like a good budget option when compared to a $500 action cam, but compared to the DJI, I don't think it's worth the $20 to $40 savings. So that makes you wonder, well, maybe the DJI is the good budget option compared to a $500 cam. I also wonder how the Acaso would fare if compared to other options in a similar price range, like the Insta360 One RS or a GoPro Hero 8, or a much cheaper option like Acaso's own Brave 7 LE at $150. I guess the point is, I wouldn't stop at weighing the Brave 8 against a $500 action camera. Consider older models in a similar price range too. You might find that it's not quite the bargain you thought it was. Hopefully that was helpful. If you have any questions, let me know. As always, thanks for watching. Take care.